Hello, good evening, and welcome. The August Falsha. Welcome to from Headland House uh, and the National Union of Journalists. Uh, my name is Seamus Dooley, and I'm the Assistant General Secretary of the NUJ. I want to just give people a few moments to join us, uh, and then we will be introducing the panel of speakers. We would encourage those of you who are uh, uh, joining us to introduce yourselves using the chat box, uh, tell us who you are, and we will in time uh, take questions. Uh, but in the first instance, we're going to uh, have an introduction, introductory comments. As Assistant General Secretary of the NUJ, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you and to thank you for joining us this evening. It is, it feels very strange and cruel that we gather in, we cannot gather in one place as a union to celebrate the spirit of our member, Lyra McKee. Those of us who were privileged to attend her funeral at St. Anne's Cathedral will never forget the dignity of Lyra's partner, her devastated family, her friends and her colleague, as they celebrated her unique sp uh, spirit following her cruel and wanton killing in Cregan two years ago. And all of you uh, are in our thoughts this evening. It is important on behalf of the National Executive Council, the General Secretary, President, uh, and all of the members of NUJ to say that we fully support the Justice for Lyra campaign and I want, as Assistant General Secretary tonight, to renew our call to anyone who may be able to assist in the prosecution of those involved in her killing to assist the police in that investigation. The wider NUJ family had intended to mark Lear's murder at our 2020 delegate meeting in Southport. Instead, on the eve of our online delegate meeting tomorrow, we are hosting an online tribute in which we aim to go beyond the headlines and to talk about Lyra's life and legacy. Lyra McKee was an outstanding journalist and her short life should not be defined by the circumstances of her death. I hate your grandiose airs, your sob stuff, your laughter and your swagger. Your assumption that everyone cares who is the king of your castle. Castles are out of date. The tide flows round the children's sandy fancy. Put up what flag you like. It is too late to save your soul with bunting. I think Lyra would have agreed with Louis MacNeese, and there was much of Louis MacNeese in her work. In her personal and professional life, Lyra sought new horizons, refusing to accept that change is impossible. Lyra knew well what it was like to struggle against great odds, but she never lost hope. She belonged to a new generation and sought to achieve change, to achieve change with love in her heart and without an ounce of hatred. Lyra marched to the sound of a different zone, and she marched for much of that journey with her partner, Sarah Canning, who will introduce us now to the Lyra she knew and loved and who she misses so much. And Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. No problem, Seamus, thank you for asking. Hi everyone, um, thank you all so much for, for coming to this panel. It's um, just really gratifying to see that people are still remembering Lyra and people still are keeping her name alive, out there and her work alive. Um, Lyra was such a vibrant person, you know, her work was often really dark um, and it could monopolise her time. You know, a lot of work had to go on to investigating cold cases and meeting all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of them, people you wouldn't really want to meet. Um, so she tried to kind of balance that out in her personal life by making sure that she just surrounded herself with her favourite people and the things that she loved. Uh, she was a very generous person, not only with her money, but with her time, um, with her knowledge, with her contacts. 
I'm sure Catherine would agree that, you know, if there was a story that Lyra came across that wasn't maybe in her, um, her remit and, and something that she wouldn't really be interested in, she passed it on to someone else who she really thought could get something from it. Um, she was also a very, um, she was a very given person and she gave a lot of herself to other people, uh, be it friends in need. You know, she was always there. Uh, I've, I've often said before that her diary terrified me. Um, she would open her, her calendar and her phone and it would just be blocked out in blue. And it would be things like, you know, a, a meeting with the NUJ or it could be phone Barton. You haven't spoken to him in a while. Contact this person who she spoke to five years ago for a story and she's worried about them because their Facebook was looking a bit iffy. You know, things like that. Um, she was generous to people she didn't know. You know, she would hear about someone on the internet who needed something and straight on there DM and what she could do. To um, if there was someone she believed in, someone whose talent she thought really deserved recognition, she gave herself to that as well. So she did like a lot of talks. Um, she paid it forward when she got her advance from Faber, when she sold her or uh, signed her contract and got the money in. She paid for a few things for people who she thought had really potential and talent, um, even though she was told off about doing it, but she did it anyway. Um, she was also just massively given to her family. She loved her family and her friends. Um, her mommy was first and foremost in everything that she did. Um, and, you know, she really placed her mommy above and beyond everything. And if that meant that she couldn't take something on board, if she couldn't do something that would, would have really benefited her, that was fine because realistically her, her mom came first um, and, you know, her, her family and her nieces and nephews, especially. Um, she loved introducing the kids to her favorite uh, incredibly geeky things. Uh, so Harry Potter books were the present that everyone got um, and trips to the cinema to see generally things like Star Wars um, were a must. You know, she she indoctrinated the children, to be fair. <laughs> um, and she was a big cinema goer. She loved, um, loved going to the cinema, would have gone three times a week if possible. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that's just because of the films, I think a lot of it has to do actually with the fact that she would get a large bucket of popcorn and dive headfirst into it. Um, and then off the back of that, there was always a Nando's visit before you went to the cinema. Uh, so I really think that both of those things were probably more important to her than the actual movie. She would love to have been uh, able to cook. But uh, she, it was one of the things, the few things in life that Lyra failed at spectacularly. Um, and it's something that I think everyone who knows her could agree. Uh, she was mocked for her endeavors in the kitchen. When she first moved up to Derry, um, I was working late one evening and she was like, listen, you know, I'll make dinner. We had gone out shopping, we bought like pizzas and all the rest of it. She was like, I'll make dinner tonight. It'll be ready for you when you come in. But she forgot that she didn't know how to use my oven. So she put the pizza in under the grill for 25 minutes, went upstairs to finish some work, came downstairs and we had what looked like a steering wheel. <laughs> so that was kind of pretty typical for Lyra's endeavors in the kitchen. Um, but the nice thing about Lyra was she always saw the funny side. She could laugh at herself. Um, she actually really enjoyed taking the mickey out of herself and loved for the banter with her friends. So I think like, for me, what I miss most, that there was never a dull moment with her. And my life's a lot quieter now. I don't, you know, I had to kind of start blocking my life out a bit whenever I had Lyra. Um, and without her, there's just not the drive to do the things that I would have done with her. Um, but she's in everything that I do and everything that our friendship group does. We always talk about her. And she made such a massive impact on all of our lives. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was lovely, and that uh, captures much of the essence uh, of Lyra. One question I did want to ask you was, I'm sure that she would have uh, taken particular pride, and I use the word advisably, uh, with the, uh, the legislation in Northern Ireland on marriage equality. Um, how did you feel when that came through? I'm sure it must have been a bittersweet moment. 
it really was it was very bittersweet but I, the other side of it was I had to kind of put my own feelings to the side and just think about the bigger picture and I know that that's something that Lyra would always have done herself um so I, I was I celebrated it. I was so happy that it happened. Um, I was so happy for the people I know who for years, you know, wanted to get married and couldn't. And now they, they can, you know, they can do it here. They don't have to, like we were talking about going across the border. Um, and to be fair, like that, that was fine because I love Donegal. But um, yeah, just the knowledge that we wouldn't have had to go as far away and that we could have been recognized as a proper married couple would have been amazing. So I, it, had to be a cause for celebration. Thank you very much. I'm tempted to um, recall the words of the Saban songwriter uh, Paul Brady. This wasn't meant to be a sad song. Uh, and thank you very much. That was lovely. Uh, Catherine Johnston is a freelance journalist who herself has faced intimidation, including being forced to flee from her own home. Uh, intimidation of journalists in Northern Ireland is nothing new and it is a constant. Uh, Catherine was a colleague, a friend, and I think in fairness that Lyra would have described her as a, as a role model, though I know that Catherine is too modest to accept that. Um, and I think Catherine will talk to us now about Lyra McKee, story breaker, headline maker. And you're on mute, Catherine, which is a rare occurrence. <laughs> right, can you hear me now? We can indeed. And I think that comment was very low, so it's <laughs> very low occurrence. But it just, I was really, really pleased to hear Sarah mentioning her driving and her cooking, because there's one particular friend of ours, Dan, who uh, always was slagging her off, and they, they had mega, mega battles about it. It was hilarious. And I was also very pleased to see, Seamus, that you mentioned uh, when uh, you, you were talking about uh, Lyra, how do you solve a problem like Maria? You know, how do you capture her life in, in one brief snapshot? And my favourite photograph of Lyra actually is about a fancy dress party in Derry. And she was dressed up as a nun. And, uh, you know, she was so innocent looking. And uh, she had a nun's headdress or wimple or whatever you call it on. But side by side with that, she had a pound of Guinness in her hand. <clears throat> and she sent, immediately sent that to uh, Her funeral with a question asking if I want to, if you want me to serve mass, I'm available. But uh, anyway, I'll get on with it. I basically I don't know how to talk about Lyra in a few minutes because although she was only 29, she crapped in one hell of a lot. The first time I met her was just after she'd been awarded uh, Sky News Young Journalist of the Year in 2006. She was 16, and within 10 years, Forbes magazine had put her on their 30 under 30 uh, in media watch list, and she was 26. And she'd already had a uh, very successful crowdfunding campaign to fund a research into the death of Reverend Robert Bradford MP, which was, was published sadly, very sadly, just after she died. And then just the year before she was killed, she'd got a two book publishing deal for, from Faber and Faber, the first of which books, The Lost Boys, about young people who had disappeared in the Troubles. She was working on at the time for death for publication last year. And she'd actually got an option from Netflix uh, for the rights of both work books. One thing that always struck me about Lyra was for all her life, from the very minute I met her, she was fascinated by the troubles, she was fascinated by the past, but not through any kind of macabre or dark interest. She was fascinated in the troubles because of the stories that were untold and because of what they could teach us about reaching towards the future and going together as a people. Now, when I met her, and she was just like this till, till the very day she died, uh, at 16, she was slightly built with a very innocent yet totally mischievous wee face. And she came across as simultaneously vulnerable and shrewd. And I think as in The Merchant of Venice, one character says, I never knew so young a body with so old a head. And that's really, Lyra looked a wee innocent young dote, but she had knowledge that it belied her appearance. She really did. She was funny, engaging, lovable. God, fiercely bright, and uh, as Sarah mentioned, she was dedicated to uncovering un injustices, dedicated to shining a light in hidden places, whether that was homelessness, young male su suicide, or the stories that were so cruelly and uh, inhumanely stripped uh, from her victims. And one thing I think we have to remember here is that Lyra's death is and was part of a continuum of threats and attacks on journalists 
and broadcasters here for doing just that, for doing their job, for seeking the truth. And as she wrote in the book she was working on at the time of her death, The Lost Boys, Northern Ireland had a way of burying uncomfortable truths, just like it buried its dead. And I think really Lyra had a very, very, very good gift for an upturned phrase and for cutting through all the, the pound of the waffle. Uh, funnily enough, the first person to ever commission a piece from me and pay for it into the bargain was Martin O'Hagan in 1985 when he was deputy editor of Fortnite magazine. Now, Marty was secretary of our Belfast and District Grants of the NUJ, which Lyra was also a member of. And in 2001, he was the first journalist to die in Northern Ireland when he was murdered by the LBF as he walked home with his wife, Marie. And uh, until Lyra was killed, he's the only journalist uh, to be killed. A journalist and fellow member of Belfast and District Grants of the NUJ. She was proposed by Breen seconded it by me and she was fiercely, fiercely proud of uh, being in the NUJ. She loved it. She she really grew on it. Um, she was much younger than me, but quite often that didn't really seem to matter. I'm not sure who that says most about. I mean, they actually started primary school in uh, North Belfast in 1994. Uh, in September uh, 94, after the first start of the first IRA ceasefire, which was when my youngest daughter was born. And at school, her, her love of reading and then later writing started. And it really, her, her great love of books came as Sarah's had mentioned with Harry Potter. And her granny bought her new Harry Potter every Christmas. And in fact, she was so devoted to J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter that uh, one of her big uh, moments in her life was when she was uh, retweeted by J.K. Rowling. And even at her funeral, Sarah wrote to us all asking us to wear Harry Potter uh, colours at her funeral, which, which very, very many of us did in her memory. Now, when, when she won, I want to read a couple of things from her writings, just very brief extracts, because I'm conscious that although a lot of you here will know her, some of you will only know her here through the covers that she got at the time of her death in 2018. Now, when she won the Sky Award uh, in 2006, she had written about suicide in North Belfast. Now, for those of you who don't know, that's become a very almost commonplace figure now. North Belfast is the highest rate of suicide for young adult males anywhere in Europe. But in 2006, in fact, in 2005, when she wrote it, it wasn't being talked about just quite as much. She started off, it was a letter to her 14 year old self. Kid, it's gonna be okay. I know you're not feeling that way right now. You're sitting in school, the other kids are making fun of you. You told the wrong person you had a crush. And soon they all knew your secret. It's horrible. They make your life hell. They laugh at you, whisper about you, and call you names. It's not nice. And you can't ask an adult for help, because if you did that, you'd have to tell them the truth. And you can't do that. They can't ever know your secret. Life is so hard right now. Every day you wake up wondering who else will find out your secret and hate you. It won't always be like this. It's going to get better. And very quickly, it did become uh, quite quite a lot better for uh, Lyra because BBC Newsline interviewed her just after she got that award. And uh, she said, this has given me a great confidence boost. It's shown me what I can do. This is my vocation. It's the love of my life. And of course, that was uh, before she met Sarah. And the very first time I met Sarah with Lyra was a really wet Saturday lunchtime in Burger King in York Gate. And it was obvious they were, they were made for each other. Again, as Sarah said, Lyra was just brimming over with love. She was devoted to her late mother, Joan, her sister, Nic Nicola. And believe it or not, she had a great niece, Ava. And she was a very, very, very loyal friend. But it was a strange thing to remember. It was very strange looking at things like this in hindsight. It's the second extract I want to read from what she wrote. And she uh, published this in her own news uh, site, The Muckraker in June 2013, Requiem for a Journalist. And I think in a way it's a pity none of us had remembered about it to, to have it read at her funeral it was, or her memorial. It was about the murder of a young online editor in Mexico, Jaime Guadalupe Gonzalez Dominguez, where she talks openly of her own fears of uh, death. And she says, every time I tweet news like this, I say it could happen to any of us. But really what I'm thinking of is it could happen to me. I'm working on a story that requires me to ask questions about dangerous people. Every day, I wonder if they're going to find out and do something about it. When I walk to the shop at night, I keep an eye on the road in case a car slows down. Parked cars make me nervous, so do men in hoodies. I rehearse the moment in my head. In reality, my fears are probably groundless. So I tell myself, I know these people have killed before. I pray they won't kill a journalist, that doing so would raise too many questions. 
but they're smarter than that. Yet if they did, how would my community re react? What would they do about it? Would they tweet like me, so sad could happen to any of us? Or would they actually do something? And I think it's very important that one of the things about Mira is she always had this feeling she was going to do something. It might fail, it might leave her with egg in her face, but that wasn't going to stop her. As Angela uh, Davis said, uh, for Lyra, it was uh, always the right time to do the, the right thing. You couldn't walk down the street uh, with her without uh, talking to somebody, whether it was somebody on the street, somebody who was homeless, somebody she'd met for another story years ago. And I mean, I'm, I'm very, very conscious, I'm very conscious that I might be making her out to sound a bit of a plaster saint. But believe you me, she was very, very, very far from uh, that. And like most of us, especially me, she had her very, very low periods, but she was really good crack to be with. She had awful fits of the giggles and she would let off steam at what one friend called her funny half hours. And uh, for by that, as a friend of mine says, mine says, she had by far the dirtiest laugh of anyone I've ever heard. And I really wish I had it on tape somewhere. I can still hear it from time to time. Now, everyone, as Sarah knows, loved the bones of Lyra. She was beautiful, intelligent, loving and generous. And not long before her death, she, she had not long moved in with Sarah. I think it was maybe a matter of months, quite, quite a few months. Now. But uh, she was away from Derry to Belfast and she called into my house to discuss plans that we had to catch up and all the biz. We were to meet at Ali Miller's the following Saturday night. Uh, there was a few of us, Sarah, Lyra, Anna Burns, who wrote The Milkman, and me were going to have dinner together. Uh, at Lyra's uh, request, and it was a band performance cooked by Ali, uh, homemade lasagna, she told Ali, with homemade chips, of course. But it you know, that, that was never to be. That was that was just two days before she was, was murdered. And this afternoon, it was quite sad, but it was also, it also, it, it brings her back to life too from time to time. I was looking through the direct messages I got from her from the year she died this afternoon. And in the middle of all the plots, plans and schemes, there was one hell of a lot of slagging, taking the hand out of each other as we say in the north of Ireland. And that, that really brought Lyra back to life for me. Um, on the anniversary of my husband's death, in the early hours of 27th December 2018, she texted me to see if she could ring me in case I was feeling low. Like, I think she'd honestly forgotten the time until she did it. But anyway, her text read, was working a shift then racing up to Derry, ferrying drunk lesbians around to actually work. Did I wake you? And, you know, I just burst out loud, which she did wake me, but I just burst out laughing when I read that. And we, we talked. And we were just a glass to help some friends. And she told me why it was really hard work for angel glass beans around Derry. But my lips were sealed. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, the story yeah. of the uh, drunk nun leads me to suggest that she was more a plastered saint than a, a plastered <laughs> saint. But there you go. Um, the ICTU's Better Work, Better Lives campaign provides a template for an inclusive society in Northern Ireland in which social dialogue and equality is cherished and which human rights are respected. And I think one of the features of uh, Lyra's work was that she was insistent that the children of the ceasefire must be offered more than platitudes. And one of the great tragedies of the death is, and of her killing is that I have no doubt that those who were on the streets of Derry that night had much more in common with Lyra than they will ever know, and that she cared for them and for their future more than they will ever know. And it's a great pleasure to welcome the Assistant General Secretary of uh, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, uh, Owen Reedy, uh, to talk to put uh, Lyra's work and legacy in the context of Northern Ireland today. Thanks very much, Seamus. I'm really happy to be on a panel with your good self and with Sarah, Catherine, and Mark, and I do feel like she, it's, it's an honour and a privilege to kind of get a glimpse into the into the life of, of Lyra from Sarah and Catherine. Um, I, I never met Lyra, I didn't know her. Um, I became much, obviously much more aware of her work uh, when she was murdered, sadly. Um, but a couple of things strike me how she has put in such a short life and such a short career, uh, a serious amount of work. Uh, her work as an investigative journalist and um, obviously one of the critical areas of journalism, every society, every good democratic society needs courageous investigative journalists who, who won't take no for an answer and who will relentlessly pursue the truth. 
um, and and her other work, as Catherine said, you know, looking at particularly the whole suicide um, in, in 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 many working class areas of Northern Ireland and in, in the youth that ceasefire babies generation, she coined it. Um, so I didn't know her, but uh, her work is incredibly impressive to me, and she she sounds like a, a, an entirely wonderful person. Um, I was struck as well by her obituary uh, in the Guardian, which said that she was a symbol of the new Northern Ireland, non-sectarian, radical, egalitarian, open and liberal. And I think, you know, when you think about where Northern Ireland's at, uh, I don't think we should take that type of society for granted because it's, it's in the balance, uh, because there are still so many people who want to uh, live in a very kind of rigid, narrow uh, orange and green dimension. You know, when we think of our identities, our identities are multifaceted. Uh, and, and when I when I when I think of Lyra's legacy, I think it's not to put anybody in a box. You know, we have the right to define ourselves politically and in every other which way we want to express ourselves. And we're multifaceted and multidimensional. And um, we we all have contradictions in our makeup, and that's part of the diversity of of, of the of, of of the human spirit. Um, and and you know, I, and again, I think. It seems there was a product of our environment. Let's remember Northern Ireland is still of the 12 UK regions, the poorest, uh, most deprived region. 25% uh, of our workers are below the real living wage. No surprise to anybody that it, 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 that precarious work is prevalent among women and young people. Um, we still have serious issues around segregation. You know, there's a debate in the assembly this week about uh, bringing the Equality Act to, to the whole area of, third, of second level education where schools shouldn't be able to discriminate on religious grounds for teachers. You know, most of our children are educated separately uh, in working class communities in particular. People live separately and, and you, know, you know, it's trotted out a lot, but it's a tragic situation that there are more peace walls in Belfast today than there were uh, in 1998. Um, but but I, I do think, um, there, there, there is hope, and I think she represented hope. And in preparing for this, when you asked me to do it, James, I, I look back at some of the things I looked at at the time of, of, of Lyra's murder. I look back at two things in particular. Catherine mentioned it, that beautifully written, very poignant uh, letter to the 14-year-old self. And I don't think anybody who, who reads it or who watches the little video, the film that was made of it, can't but be struck by the just the sheer honesty of that. Um, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, I think anyone uh, who, who, who struggled with their own self in their teenage years uh, can't but not identify with that. And her TED Talks, her Stormont Women's TED Talks, which I thought was really uh, beautiful and brilliant um, and a beautiful, beautiful presentation of storytelling. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to have a look at it. And it struck me as important for two reasons. Um, I mean, the point that she was making uh, I think which symbolized a lot of her work, particularly her campaigning, social justice work on LGBT rights, was about you know her, her trip to America, visiting the mosque in Orlando. And I suppose the, the you know the, the really important thing at that mosque uh, was one of the first uh, groups that came out and condemned the murder uh, sometime before 49 people happily celebrating having a night out in the gay bar post. Um, and that point that the mosque, as part of that community, came out uh, and, and, and condemned it. And she talked about her discussions with uh, an elderly Muslim man and uh, how uh, a, a young guy stood up and talked about his pal who committed suicide because he was a Muslim and a gay. And he was Muslim and gay and he, he felt he couldn't cope. Um, and it struck me on two levels. One, on, on the social justice level, how, you know, it seemed to me her politics were as much personal and political about conversations, winning people over one by one um, and how important that is. And it also struck me when you look at the politics of Northern Ireland today and the future of Northern Ireland and, and the, you know, the peace that was hard won, which is by no means secured and certain. There's too many people who live in a world of black and white and right and wrong and fear and hate and our politics uh, is in a straitjacket, a very narrow straitjacket of two competing nationalisms. Uh, and there's so much more out there. And there are too many politicians, usually male 
politicians who are so self-righteous and so certain of themselves and so certain of their position. And it seems to me they don't have enough conversations with the other, whoever the other is, whether it's someone from a, a different political tradition, whether it's someone uh, from a different background, whether it's someone from a different end of the political spectrum, because there are so many different political cleavages. And it really struck me when I watched that TED Talks earlier today, that the moral of the story um, of, you know, having conversations, winning people over one by one, um, was crucial to achieve marriage equality uh, in, in Northern Ireland, which Lira Sarah and many other people campaigned for. But it's also crucial to win the society that I think everybody deserves. And crucially that young who aren't defined by orange and green, you know, their, their lives are much more interesting uh, and dynamic uh, and they define themselves in so many other ways. And that's not to be insulting, by the way, to anybody who does define themselves in those terms, but I think we live in a multifaceted world. And I think we need to, when, when, I, when I look at her work and when I think of where Northern Ireland's at, I think that legacy is crucial. And it really struck me today when I, when I watched that TED talk. So um, I, I, I'm just very happy to, to be part of this, to get a, a kind of a glimpse into, into Lyra's life through Sarah and Catherine. Um, and um, I wish Sarah all, all, all the best for the years ahead. But I think Lyra's legacy is a rich one uh, and we'll live on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Owen. Uh, when we decided to mark the killing of Lyra in Dublin, I had no hesitation that one of the things we needed to do was to celebrate her activism to the LGBT plus community. And one of the most abiding memories, which Sarah in her brief would not have been able to share, was to, uh, to stand and look at Gloria, Dublin's Gay and Lesbian Choir, standing on the steps of the Hugh Lane Gallery, singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And that will abide with me. And it was interesting because they, you know, it reverberated and echoed to the Garden of Remembrance. And it was a really interesting uh, location. Uh, and certainly it was removed from the black and white world of moral certainties um, that that Owen has so adequately described. Uh, there is no pressure at all uh, on Erica Starling Productions, on Alison or on Mark McCauley as director of photographer uh, in capturing the enormous spirit of, of Lyra McKee in the forthcoming film, Ceasefire Baby. Uh, we joked, uh, before the film about it being like uh, capturing uh, a butterfly, someone that flew away in so many different directions. Uh, Mark is the director of photography. He's an award-winning cinematographer, uh, but he would claim like so many modest people on this panel that his greatest achievement is that he's from Derry. Uh, Mark, over to you. Uh, th uh, thanks, Seamus. Um, thanks, Owen. Um, uh, I'm I'm kind of here really because um, uh, Alison Miller, who was um, friends with Lyra, um, who's directing the film, she's still in the edit suite um, trying to to finish the film. Um, uh, she's got a fantastic editor with her, Chloe Lamborn, and um, I, I think people may well have seen um, the documentary for Sama, um, which Chloe was the editor on. Um, so all, all I can say is that it's been great listening to Catherine and to Sarah speak about Lyra because my involvement in the film is we've been at it for more than a year, possibly, Sarah. And I think that almost 